in our last session for Block One, I think it's probably appropriate that we talk about the role of the Congress in national security. It's appropriate because as several folks uh, of some prominence have observed in the past, uh, the kind of military we get ranging from the pay raises you may get in January to the kinds of commissaries you have to the weapons you use, all of those things are totally reliant on congressional action. And if we don't understand how the Congress plays in all of that, we are likely to misunderstand the kinds of things that we have to work with in our jobs every day. So we start, as we have several times during the course of this block, uh, with the Constitution. And the Constitution mandates that there are three equal branches of government in the federal government of the United States. And because of the prominence that the legislative branch is given in the Constitution, one might argue that it is the first among equals. Um, I think that was clearly the idea of the Founding Fathers. Uh, it hasn't worked out that way in practice over the last couple hundred years, but that was the original intent. So who makes up this Congress then? And what you basically see is that there are two houses. You probably know most of this stuff. And these are sort of the uh, general rules in which they operate and the kinds of uh, restrictions on who can and cannot be a member of the Senate, uh, how much they make, uh, surprisingly little for the kinds of hours and dime, time devoted to their work, and the general rules in which they, uh, under which they operate. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that Congress, under the Constitution, is responsible for. And I've highlighted the three that are most relevant to the Department of Defense and to us as military professionals. And the two that really are most important to us is the idea of raise and support armies and provide and maintain a Navy. Uh, it's interesting that it's called raise and support. There was not an idea that you would have a full-time, long, large standing army. That has been a function of our existence in the post-World War II period. It didn't exist that way before that. There was a recognition by the original Congress and the, the people who framed the Constitution that navies were sort of a long-term thing and that ships weren't something you could raise uh, very, very quickly. So it was provide and maintain a navy. The difference in words were a function of the times in which all of this was written. So what does Congress do? Well, uh, there are really five big things that it's supposed to be doing, and according to the Constitution, uh, those are listed on the left. Uh, the half dozen things that are there uh, include impeachment because it's an important function. We see it in the sort of press today, but it's not something that actually happens all that often. The tools which are used by the Congress in order to accomplish these things are listed in the gold box on the right. The idea is that the Congress does the budget work. It does uh, all of the ideas to the overall scheme as to what the budget will look like. It authorizes the budget. That is, it allows programs to exist. It then appropriates money to uh, make sure that the programs that it wants to exist are funded. And it takes a look at whether or not the programs that they have authorized and appropriated money to are being conducted the way they had intended. So they conduct all kinds of investigations in order to be able to do that. They do that by calling hearings and subpoenaing, subpoenaing witnesses. And finally, they have a check on the overall conduct of the executive branch with the power to confirm appointments. How a bill becomes law is, is actually very, very complicated. And as a result of that, almost none of the bills which are actually originally introduced into either house becomes law. It's a, a vanishingly small percentage in recent years, uh, under 5% of the bills introduced to in any given Congress actually uh, become law at the end of the day. So the process that is outlined here simplifies it a good deal, but it begins to give you an idea as to what is going to happen. Uh, if I look at budgetary bills, the majority of them, I think, 
uh, are by the Constitution, started in the House. The Senate occasionally will tack stuff in, but the bill is introduced. The Speaker then will refer it to uh, an appropriate committee. This is really governed by the uh, majority leaders and, and the Speaker of the House. Uh, the House committees will refer it to a subcommittee. Subcommittee will act on it. Um, changes to the bill are voted on by the committee, and then it goes to full House and debate. Assuming it gets past all of those hurdles, the bill is then forwarded over to the parliamentarian of the Senate, who then sends that to a committee and subcommittee and so on. Assuming that the bill gets through that, the odds of it being identical to the bill sent over by the House are extraordinarily small. So both bills are sent to a conference committee. The conference committee, under guidance from the rules committees, will then try and negotiate uh, changes to the bill to make it acceptable to both houses of the Congress. Once the Senate and the House have approved the results of the conference committee, they forward it on to the president. This is an extraordinarily difficult process, and it explains, at least in part, why it seems like so little is done by the Congress. It's by design. That was the intention to begin with. The idea was to make it extremely difficult for the Congress to accomplish anything and to change much in any given year. Where we see this as a problem is when this extraordinarily tortured process applies to budget bills and leads us to the continuing resolution world in which we live today. Okay, what are the different kinds of committees? Uh, this is sort of uh, of interest to you. The ones that we have to worry about overwhelmingly are the standing committees. And the reason that we need to worry about those is because those are the ones that tend to uh, both authorize and appropriate money for our operations. The key defense committees are the Senate and House Armed Services Committee. Those are the committees that do the authorization. They're the ones that uh, allow different programs to exist. Uh, if you look at the Armed Services Committee, you can see that it deals with the Armed Forces, the National Guard, Pay and Allowances, Atomic Energy, and uh, War and National Defense, and various items of our existence exist under almost all of these things. Um, the Senate Armed Services Committee is a reflection of that because it tends to, in its various subcommittees, look at pretty much the same kinds of things that the House does. Interestingly, it is a subcommittee of the House of Senate Appropriations Committees that deal with the uh, appropriation of money uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee is huge. Uh, over half of the members of the Senate belong to it. I'm sorry, over a quarter of the members of the Senate belong to it. And the same thing is true that the House Appropriations Committee is also very, very large. These are very, very important committees to our existence because of the way they actually get money to programs. I mentioned quickly that the Senate Armed Services Committee sort of reflected the House Armed Services Committee. In this, you can see that they're not identical, and this is one of the reasons that you see differences in authorization bills coming out of the House and the Senate. Uh, at the same time, there is overlap, and they do work well together, and there are certain kinds of things that happen that are important for us to understand. As members of the Navy, you can see both the House and the Senate have sea power committees, uh, and you can see that they all have military personnel committees, uh, and they all have strategic concerns as well. One of the things we worry about is who's in control of war powers, and this has been a long-term debate between the Congress and the White House. The president really believes and, and has some constitutional authority for it, uh, that they are allowed to engage in certain kinds of activities without having to get congressional approval first. Uh, as you can see here, what we've got is a list of presidents who have done things uh, without really getting uh, approval. And this is just a partial list. It's important to understand that that's the case. Uh, and Congress, with an amazing irregularity, declares war. 
you can get it in World War One and World War Two. Those were de declarations of war, maybe for the Spanish-American and Mexican War, and almost clearly for the War of 1812. But there are an awful lot of conflicts besides these five. And the question is, can the president actually commit military forces? According to the Constitution, Section 2, probably yes. Uh, but that's a debate between the president and the Congress on a routine basis. And the executive branch would argue, well, if you're so hot to declare war, why haven't you declared it in all these other instances? Uh, most notably in places like uh, Iraq for Desert Shield, and Desert Storm, um, Afghanistan after uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, any of these really have not been subjected to a declaration of war. And one might wonder why. Well, there's a whole list of reasons that uh, you might not want to do that. But it still is somewhat amazing in that it really gives the president an awful lot of power because he will commit forces uh, with some restrictions, to be sure. Uh, and the Congress will not act to declare war for a variety of reasons. And this leads us to the War Powers Resolution. And what this says is a, an attempt by the Congress to recognize that the world is a much more complicated place even than it was at the beginning of World War II, that things happen really, really quickly, and that the president sometimes needs to act. So what the War Powers Resolution does is it says that the president has to consult with Congress before introducing American Armed Forces, um, if at all possible. And the debate is whether or not it is at all possible. What most of the time happens is that before the president commits forces, consults with the Senate and House leadership, this is the uh, Senate majority leader, Senate minority leader. It includes the Speaker of the House, who, by the way, is third in line, for, uh, second in line for succession. Um, if for some reason the president and the vice president are declared or are become ineligible to uh, serve in the office of president, the next person in line uh, to fill that is the Speaker of the House. So it's a really important job. It includes then also the House majority and minority leaders. Uh, that usually is considered uh, consulting with Congress before that happens. And then there's a more formal consultation process afterwards. I want to talk also about the federal budget process um, to a very limited extent here. There are, as you can see, four different types of committees that are going to deal with the budget um, and what is important about them. The bubbles on the right-hand side really describe what happens in each of these. And this is a major takeaway, I think, for all of you in understanding that it is a complicated process. And as we suggested above, it can get clogged up pretty easily. There are different kinds of spending, and there are different ways in which it is spent. Mandatory spending is something like Social Security, payment on the debt. That is, it's written into law that the U.S. is going to pay those bills unless they write a new law to change it. And the odds, for example, of them writing a law to say that they won't make Social Security payments is vanishingly small. Discretionary spending is what comes out and of the uh, Appropriations Committee to fund the actual ongoing operations of the federal government. So the Department of Defense budget, by and large, is a discretionary element of the federal budget. Not all money that is appropriated in a given year is spent in that year, so that you see a staggered approach. The budget authority is what you can spend in a given year, and the outlays of what is actually spent in much appropriations language, it says that they'll spend a certain amount of money in year one, two, and three, especially for large programs. If you look at, as an example, construction of aircraft carriers, they have a certain amount of budget authority and then outlays on a year-to-year -year basis. 